and welcome to After Alexander, episode 19, Epirus. Today's topic is one which has been mentioned on and off in the later episodes of Seleucus' reign, but which I've never been able to address properly because of the fast pace and needs of the main narrative. So today, we're going to discuss Epirus, a kingdom considered right on the fringes of the Greek world, and which could claim to have one of the few family ties to Alexander the Great left in the whole world. I initially didn't think there was going to be that much to talk about when I started doing my research, but I rapidly discovered a narrative full of surprising twists, coups, revolts, and wars. Forget the Wars of the Roses. If you want drama, head to ancient Epirus. So, let's explore the history of a people and a kingdom. There are two stories about where exactly Epirus came from. One as told by the people themselves through myth, and one the modern, more accurate version. I'm going to start with what we know about the history, and then move on to their mythical origins later, for reasons that will make sense in a moment. A group called the Molossians, supposed to have been one of the 14 tribes of Epirus, appear to have migrated into the region in the 500s BCE. Molossians were also among the colonists who settled on the Ionian shores during its Greek colonisation from about 1020 BCE to about 900 BCE. And yes, these are the Ionian Greeks which will start our whole story off back when the Persian Empire still ruled the roost. As time went on, the Epirutes were initially friendly to Corinth, but later switched to ally with Athens during the latter decades of the reign of King Tharips, who reigned from about 430 to 392 BCE. I'm not going to bore you with a long list of kings, but what is relevant to bear in mind is that Epirus wasn't centralised or unified until about 370 BCE. In fact, it wasn't until Alexander I of Epirus, who I'm going to mention again later on, that a ruler was truly given the title of King of Epirus. Before then, coins had been minted by the three main Epirot tribes rather than by one king, which should give you some idea of the decentralisation of the region. With that said, let's now turn to the more dramatic version of the Epirot origin story, the mythical version. As I believe I've mentioned in the past, the kings of Epirus claimed descent from Achilles, the main hero of the Trojan War. Achilles is said to have fathered a son called Neoptolemus by a woman called Didamia. According to one version, he was living at her father's court while disguised as a woman to avoid fighting in the Trojan War. This avoidance was because Achilles' mother knew that he would die if he fought, so tried to hide him away to prevent him being recruited. Now, because this isn't the Greek myth podcast, I'm going to avoid going into that story in any more detail, but for our purposes, Achilles was the father of Neoptolemus, a man famous for his bravery, eloquence, and beauty. He was alternatively called Pyrrhus for his red hair, and because the name that his father Achilles had taken while disguised as a woman was Pyrrha. I should say at this point that I've just discovered I've been saying that name wrong for the past few episodes. I'm going to try and switch to the new pronunciation, and just hope that this doesn't confuse you all too much. But anyway, Pyrrhus is the correct version, not Pyrrhus, as I've been saying. But back to Neoptolemus. He also fought in the Trojan War, after being recruited by the trickster figure Odysseus. The reason for this was that a prophet called Helenus had foretold that the war could only be concluded if a descendant of Aeacus fought. He's Achilles' granddad, by the way. Neoptolemus was also one of the soldiers who hid in the Trojan horse, and personally killed Priam, the king of Troy, along with several of the Trojan royal family. As a quick aside, keep this name Priam in mind for when we get to covering Roman history and mythology, as the Trojan War is going to be relevant. One of Priam's many sons, Hector, had married a woman called Andromache. Neoptolemus supposedly killed their infant son Astyanax and made Andromache his concubine. The two of them were the parents of Molossus, 
Hyalus and Pergamus. Along with the prophet Helenus and Phoenix, the couple sailed to the Epirot Islands, and Neoptolemus became the king of Epirus. His death is told in one of two ways. The first is that he was killed while attempting to take a woman called Hermione from a man called Orestes, as this woman had originally been promised to, ne to Neoptolemus. The other version says that he was killed by the Delphic priests of Apollo after he denounced Apollo for killing his father Achilles. After the death of Neoptolemus, his realm was divided between his sons and the prophet Helenus, who married Andromache. A festival was supposedly held every eight years in his honour. Molossus was, according to tradition, the ancestor of the Molossian people and the Epirate kings, who thus claimed to be full Greeks. This supposedly prevented a serious discussion about how Greek the Epirates really were, of which the Molossians were a part. As we've seen, the degree of Greekness was very important to the inhabitants of ancient Greece, and the Epirut kings used this lineage to form relationships with other ancient Greek states. Family trees like this were accepted and an established practice at the time. Think Alexander the Great claiming male line descent from Heracles, for instance. Some theorised that the rulers of Epirus deliberately created this link to a hero of the Trojan War, which was not established practice at the time, apparently, to give themselves a political leg up in local power struggles. It isn't clear when the establishment of this genealogy happened, but it seems to have occurred by the 400s BCE at the latest. What I find interesting is that the myth specifically says that the realm of Epirus was divided after the death of Neoptolemus. Now, this next bit is pure speculation on my part based on the sources I've seen so far, but it seems possible to me that the Epirates were maybe trying to explain their own history here. After all, the Epirates were not politically unified for a large part of their history, which must have needed explaining when talking about where they came from. Grains of salt needed here, obviously. I'm now going to fast forward a bit to the death of King Alcetas I, the son of the King Tharips slash Tharipas I mentioned just now, in 370 BCE. On his death, his sons Neoptolemus I and Aribas agree to rule alongside each other, splitting the kingdom between themselves. You might expect that this state of affairs could only ever end horribly, but astonishingly, the two brothers reigned harmoniously and peacefully until the natural death of Neoptolemus, never once going to war or having their relationship impacted, in what I'm sure is one of the only examples of such a peaceful co-kingship in history. Neoptolemus I died in 360 BCE, from what I can tell, leaving behind him an infant son, Alexander, and a daughter, Troas, who had married her uncle, Aribas. Alexander was only a child, meaning that Aribas assumed sole kingship on his brother Neoptolemus' death. I don't know if this was an agreed-upon precedent or not, but Alexander doesn't seem to have been too happy or felt too safe with the arrangement, as in 350 BCE, he turned up at the court of Philip II of Macedon to ask for his protection. In 343-342, Philip II invaded Epirus, ejected Arabas, and made his charge Alexander I, of Ma ruler of Epirus. This is also, incidentally, where Olympias resurfaces in our story. For those of you who don't remember, she's the mother of both Alexander the Great and Cleopatra of Macedon by Philip II. What I've actually discovered since I talked about her last is that Olympias was not her birth name. Her father had actually named her Polyxena, and she took the name Mertali just before marrying Philip as part of an initiation ceremony into a mystery cult. As a quick aside, Olympias seems to have been something of a fan of mystery cults, as she was a devotee of the snake-worshipping followers of Dionysus, and seems to have slept with snakes in her bed, at least according to Plutarch. She had married Philip as part of an alliance between Arabas and Philip II, made in 358 BCE, shortly after the death of Neoptolemus. Continuing the mystery cult theme, it is suggested that the two had fallen in love at their initiations into the mysteries of Kabairi, 
Philip's bride Myrtale took her third of four names in 356 BCE, Olympias, when Philip's horse won at the Olympic Games. In case any of you are wondering, her final name was Stratonike, which she probably took as an epithet in 317 BCE following her victory over Eurydice, the daughter of Mintus IV and the wife of Philip III. I'm going to stick with calling her Olympias, despite the fact that the accuracy of this changes over time, as otherwise life is going to get unnecessarily confusing. As we know, Philip II eventually rejected Olympias in 337 BCE. She sought revenge by appealing to her brother, King Alexander of Epirus, to invade. However, he refused, and even made a fresh alliance with Philip II by marrying his daughter, and thus his own niece, Cleopatra, in 336 BCE. It was at this same wedding that Philip II would be assassinated. Now, I'm going to skip lightly over the question of his assassination, partly because the details of the event are not relative to our broader narrative, and partially because I might make it a bonus episode on Philip II someday. After this, Alexander's nephew, and now also brother-in-law, Alexander III succeeded to the throne of Macedon. So, now we come to the question of whether or not Epirus was part of Alexander's empire. I've seen different maps which var variously place it within the borders of the empire or not, but it seems that it was independent, although possibly under the influence of Alexander the Great. I haven't really been able to find anything concrete on this though. Regardless, Alexander I of Epirus at least had enough independence to cross into the Italian peninsula in 334, when he was asked for help against the Italian tribes by the Greek colony of Taras. He won a victory over the Samnites and Lucanians two years later in 332, before making a peace treaty with the Roman Republic. I feel like I should probably mention that this is officially now the first time that Rome has properly appeared in our story. Spoiler alert, it's not going to be the last, not by a long shot. Anyway, among other cities, Alexander I took Heraclea from the Lucanians. This seems to have irritated them, as he was eventually tricked by the Lucanians into fighting an unfavourable battle in 331 and was killed. The Romans seem to have used him and this Italian excursion as part of their narrative of prowess, when comparing the two Alexanders, and asking how the Romans would have fared if they'd fought against Alexander the Great, Livy noted that the nephew fought against women, which I can only assume means that they were considering themselves more worthy opponents than the Persians in the unfortunate talk of the time. When Alexander died, his cousin Aesides came to the throne. Aesides was the son of Arabas and Troas, making him a descendant of both brothers who had initially held power. Now, an important thing to note about him is that he's actually the younger son of Arabas. The older, called Alcetas after his grandfather, was disinherited by Arabas on account of his temper. Aesides married a woman called Phythia and had two children. A daughter called Didamia, probably named for her supposed ancestress, and a son called Pyrrhus. And yes, this is the Pyrrhus who's been meddling with everyone and everything for the past few episodes. In 317 BCE, Aesides would take part in the Wars of the Successors, and help Polypercon restore Olympias and Alexander IV to Macedon. I assume this refers to the sole kingship of Macedon after the death of Philip III, but the article I accessed isn't particularly clear in its wording. In 316, he raised an army and marched to help Olympias again, who was being beleaguered by Cassander's forces. However, the Epirates revolted as they couldn't abide military service. Aesides was driven from the kingdom, and the two-year-old Pyrrhus had to be saved by some servants. Macedon took over rule of Epirus for a few years after this, but eventually the Epirates tired of Macedonian rule and called Aesides back from exile in 313. This naturally prompted Cassander to send his brother Philip into the region with an army, and Aesides was killed in battle the same year. 
the older brother of Aesides now succeeded to the throne after all, as Alcetas II. He had been in exile up to this point, but the Epirates summoned him back to become their king when Aesides died, which might well have been an attempt to fend off Macedonian rule. Cassander would send out an army against him as well, but the two sides eventually made peace in 312 BCE. The Epirates are eventually said to have broken into revolt against his outrages, but I can't find what these actually specifically were. I don't think this refers to the peace treaty, as there is a gap of some years between the two events. Whatever it really was, in this revolt, Alcidas II and his two infant sons were killed, and Pyrrhus, son of Aeusides, succeeded to the throne in 306 or 307 BCE, depending on the source, having been installed on the throne by King Glaucias of the Illyrians, who was protecting him. For reference, incidentally, you could think of Illyria as approximately the coast of modern-day Croatia. Pyrrhus was only about 11 or 12 when he came to the throne, having been born in 319 BCE. A regency was therefore established until he was old enough to rule. He made an alliance with Demetrius Polyorchites upon his accession. In 302, when he was approximately 17, he travelled to Illyria to be present at the wedding of one of Glaucius' sons. While he was absent, yet another revolt broke out, and Pyrrhus' first cousin once removed was installed as Neoptolemus II. This Neoptolemus is the son of Alexander I that I mentioned earlier on. Glaucias was unable to help Pyrrhus, so he was duly ejected from his throne and replaced by Neoptolemus. Pyrrhus then fought alongside Demetrius I, who had married his sister Didamia. For those who are interested, they would have one son called Alexander, who was supposed to have spent his life in comfortable captivity in Egypt. The same fate would in fact befall Pyrrhus when he was sent to Alexandria as a hostage as part of a treaty between Demetrius and Ptolemy I in 298 BCE. While in Egypt, he befriended Ptolemy I and married his stepdaughter Antigone, one of the children of Berenike by her first marriage. Cassander's death in 297 prompted Ptolemy to try and help Pyrrhus get his kingdom back, eager to gain a friend in Epirus. So, with money and men provided, Pyrrhus set off and was restored to his kingdom in 297. Initially, a co-kingship was agreed between Pyrrhus and Neoptolemus. However, soon afterwards, and perhaps predictably, Pyrrhus had his cousin Neoptolemus II assassinated, meaning that, in 297, the last full nephew of Alexander the Great died. From then on, Pyrrhus ruled alone. He would go on to invade Macedon, as we saw, in the turmoil before the death of Seleucus I. Now, I should probably mention a quick note on the Antigonids at this point. Antigonus II essentially seems to drop out of the story after his father Demetrius dies. It's mentioned in the Encyclopaedia Britannica article on Pyrrhus that Lysimachus replaced Demetrius in 284, and it was Lysimachus who drove Pyrrhus back after he took the western half of Macedon during his invasion. It's mentioned that Antigonus II only had a few strongholds left in the fighting after his father's death, so he does seem to be largely supplanted for a while by the other players. Once we get into the reign of Antiochus I, and marriage alliances become relevant, I'll do a full episode catching us up on what's been happening with the Antigonids during this time. So, that's Epirus. I'm going to separate the rest of Pyrrhus' story from our main Epirus narrative, as he's going to become a lot more relevant when we finally get to properly talking about the Romans at the start of the reign of Antiochus III. I've already decided that I'm probably going to do a short series covering Roman history and their origin story before we start his reign in 222 BCE. So, when that happens, I'll give Pyrrhus and his Epirus successors a separate episode. This means that you can probably look forward to an Epirus Part 2, in a sense. I should perhaps mention that I've seen one chronology where Aesides takes power in 331, as I said, but that Neoptolemus II then has a short reign from 317 to 313, 
before Aesides takes back over and is ejected as normal. From there, the rest of the chronology essentially continues unchanged. I've only found this split reign mentioned in one chronology, and I've not been able to find an explanation for it so far at least, so while it may possibly be right, I've ignored it for now while discussing the main timeline. Next time, the focus of our story will shift eastwards to the Nabataeans, a people group who built a kingdom near the eastern border of Egypt during the time of the successors, and who, like Epirus, I basically skipped over during our narrative. Then, in two weeks' time, we'll introduce Antiochus I and discuss his life up until the moment of his accession to full power in 281. That won't quite be a full resumption of the narrative just yet, as I think we should have a quick look around at what the world would have looked like at the moment that Antiochus I came to power, but we'll be back in the right time period at least. Then, finally, we'll set the bowl of history rolling again. Until then, thank you all for listening. For any comments or questions, you can get in touch with the show at afteralexpod at gmail.com. Until next time, have a great week everyone.